Hi, this is your instructor, Evan Chang Su, and this is our first lecture in ET350 uh, Electrical Machinery. Uh, in today's lecture, we're going to do a review. You've seen this before in ET250, Physical Quantities versus Units, uh, also Energy and Power for Linear and Rotational Systems and Radiance. So this is all review stuff, but I want to bring it up to the surface. I know it's been a, a long summer, and so we want to get all these things nice and fresh. Now, these are in some way a review from physics, but this has probably been a, a quite a bit of time. But we're going to talk about magnetic flux. Uh, flux density, and then the definition of flux and how these two relate. And this is very fundamental to the beginning of our course and trying to understand how motors and generators and transformers work. Okay. All right. So let's begin with our review, physical quantities versus units. Okay. So physical quantities versus units, if you recall, uh, physical quantity is something, a physical property of a phenomenon body or substrate that can be measured. The key is the ability to measure it. Right, And some examples that we've seen in ET250 are length, time, mass, weight, voltage, current, resistance, stuff like that. They can be measured. All right. Now the unit, the difference is, of course, the standard for that measurement, Right, the standard quantity. And so for length, we have feet, meters, inches, centimeters, seconds for time, kilogram slugs for mass, and newtons, pounds for weight. So these are just examples of units for the physical quantities. And uh, just to review, I like to put the brackets, you guys know me by now, um, around the units, the symbol for the units, so that I know the difference between that and the symbol for the physical quantity. Because there are four things that I want you to remember. One is the physical quantity itself, the symbol for the physical quantity, the unit and the symbol for the unit. Uh, again, a review, you've seen this before, Voltage V, volt V, this is an easy one where the physical quantity is this and it, see, it matches the unit, okay? A harder one is the inductance, inductance for the physical quantity, symbol is L, kind of weird. Uh, Henry is the unit and the symbol is H. Okay, let's see if we can get a little bit better in focus. Yeah, that's a little bit better, okay. All right, now I'm gonna list out a bunch of physical quantities that, uh, are going to be useful for ET350. Okay, of course, we have the basics, right? Length, force, right? Newtons, right? Uh, angle, theta, radians, or rads for the unit. Okay, of course, we can use degrees, but radians are going to be very uh, important for our measurements because they can be directly used to calculate energy and power. Uh, angular velocity. Uh, the symbol is omega, this W-like symbol, and it's radians per second, and uh, it's radi uh, rad per S, but we also will have RPM, and you will have to know how to convert between RPM and radians per second. That's actually pretty easy. Okay, torque, uh, we have the tau, okay, the tau symbol, the Greek tau symbol, and this is a Newton meter. And, M, uh, and remember, a newton meter is actually the same unit as energy or joule, right? By coincidence, nice. Um, energy, E, joule, J, right? Power, P, watt, W. Now, this is uh, the, the new stuff or the stuff that's, uh, that we're going to immediately need for 350. Flux, phi, this is the Greek letter phi. It's a circle with a line through it. Okay, let me draw that circle a little bit better. Uh, and we use Weber for the units and WB, WB for the symbol for Weber, okay? Just got to memorize it. Remember these four things, okay? Now, this is important. There's a big distinction. We'll go through that in the rest of this lecture. Flux density, not flux, but flux density. Some people will call it flux, and you have to be kind of careful when you're listening, but you should know the difference between flux and flux density by the end of this lecture and definitely by the end of this course. So we use the symbol B, and then it is a unit, Tesla, and the capital T, all right? So flux phi, flux density B, Weber for flux, Tesla for flux density. Got to know the difference. This is, this is just something you got to put in the memory banks. Uh, you already know this, inductance L Henry H. Uh, this is important. This is the material constant for how well magnetic fields flow through uh, materials. Permeability, and this is the Greek letter mu. And this is a weird one. Weber per amp meter, 
or WB over AM. And I have to, you know, the units, I always have to like relook, relook up Wikipedia, Google, you know, but definitely having intuition for what mu is. So like iron is going to have a high mu, whereas wood is going to have a very low mu or plastics, low mu. Okay. All right. Uh, magnetic field strength. H, that's the symbol. Now, don't confuse it with the symbol for Henry or uh, inductance, right? The unit, right? This is the symbol for the physical quantity. Remember, four different things, right? And we have an amp turn per meter. And what does the turn mean? The turn is like literally how many turns, right? And so you can see it's closely related to current, right? This, so you can think of it as like a solenoid, right? You're going to get more magnetic field strength if you apply more current in a solenoid. Right? And so that's why it has units of amps in it. Okay. Um, uh, the turn, by the way, I have this arrow here. The turn is really like unitless. It's just the number of turns. Magnetomotive force. It's this script F, amp turn, or just amps. And then reluctance, this kind of script R, and it's an inverse Henry, one over Henry. Now, these three, um, we're not going to cover too much in this class. We, we might see this a little bit. These ones we're not really going to see, but I just wanted to present this here just so that you, you know, if you see it in the future, like, okay, I think I heard about it. You could always Google it and look it up later, but definitely these two and mu are going to be big, right? Okay, let's keep going. Okay, so some more confusion with these physical quantities versus units. We have the four things, the physical quantity, the symbol, the unit, and the symbol, right? Now, um, the other thing that you have to remember is that some physical quantities are vectors and some are scalars, right? Uh, you have to know the difference. So, for example, a scalar might be mass, right? And you just have to worry about magnitude. But remember a vector, what do we have for a vector? We have magnitude and direction, right? Magnitude and direction. So speed, force, they both have a magnitude, an amount, and a direction. And some of these physical quantities will have that. For example, B. B will be a vector and phi will be a scalar. That's why I bring this up. Okay. Just a review on notation. You guys should have been hammered. This should have been hammered in your like statics class. Um, how to denote a vector, you can add a hat, right? Um, like this or like this, and you, you want an arrow as well, right? So the magnitude of this vector, you can use these vertical lines to denote that vector. And so this V without the hat is the scalar, right? Notice the difference, okay? So V, little v in this case, is the length of this vector, V hat, okay? If it's a little bit, you know, too fast, pause the video, but this should be review. You should have had this like locked down from statics and dynamics. Okay. Okay, good. Um, you, and you already know, I've mentioned this before a year ago, but I, I know it's a year ago, added confusion, multiple units for the same physical quantity. And you know this already. Energy, I already stated this, Newton meters and joules, they're uh, equivalent, right? Power watts, joules per second, newton meters per second. Notice multiple units for the same physical quantity. In this case, they're all equivalent within the SI system, but you might have other uh, units that are not equivalent. Like you already know that 100 centimeters is a meter, 1,000 millimeters is a meter, right? 12 inches and a foot, blah, 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 and you have miles, right? These could be different, right? So you just have to know the difference. So we have what? Physical quantities versus units. We have the four things, the name of the physical quantity, we have the symbol, we have the unit and the symbol, and you have to know, is it a scalar or a vector? And you have to know for the unit, which unit are you gonna use, right? So that it's just a frustrating thing, but that's just part of engineering and you have to uh, look for this, right? You have to look for this. Okay, um, confidence as <laughs> kind of to hit home, confidence in the physical quantities and units will be very helpful, right? It, this is what's gonna help you build your intuition, right? Okay, let's keep going. Okay, like I said, I wanted to highlight energy and power for linear rotational systems. And the reason why is because in our labs and in a lot of this electrical machinery, things are rotating or translating. And if we have a sense of what the, how we describe the energy and power, we are gonna be better off. Okay, so let's look at energy. And we just mentioned energy is joule, right? That's the unit, okay, so very good. 
Okay, what are the equations for linear energy and rotational energy? Well, for linear energy, it's force times distance. For rotational energy, it's torque times angle, right? So this is not a seven, this is tau. So maybe I can, I can actually change this just so it's a little more clear. I'm gonna make it a little squiggly. There we go. Okay, so that's a tau times theta. Now we have to be careful. This theta is not degrees. No, 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 no. This is radians. That's why we're gonna come back to radians, right? And remind us what a radian is. I know we went over it in 250, but we're gonna bring it up. So a lot of this lecture is just brushing off the rust, right? From, you know, you've learned it before. Now we're gonna learn it again. It's like seeing a movie the second time and hopefully you can pick up more details. Okay, let's look at the units. Energy we know is a joule, but look at these individual broken out units. Force is a newton and L is a meter, newton meter. And that's why these are equivalent. You can see it directly. A newton meter and a joule are the same thing, right? And let's think physically what's going on. The amount of energy I can put into a system is the force I'm applying over a certain distance, right? Just like gravity, when you, when you pick up something, right? You get that potential energy. You're applying that force, that uh, MGH, right? That MG, that force over across that H, that's the potential energy that you're putting in to that system, right? Okay. And so here we have force times length, newton times meter. And so you have a newton meter is equivalent to a joule. Yay. All right. Now, if we look at the rotational version, we have a radian, which is again, not degrees. It's a unit of angle, but it's technically unitless and torque we know is a newton meter. Again, newton meters, newton meters, we have consistency in the physical units. Yay, okay. Power, if you recall, power is the derivative, the time derivative or time rate of change of energy. If energy is money, power is how, much, how fast you spend that money, right? If energy is like distance, power is like velocity. Okay, so these, you can see how they're correlated with the units, joules and joules per second, and we get watts as they are equivalent. You have to fundamentally know the differences between these two. I mean, this, as an engineer by now, as a senior, you got to have this solid. All right, so let's look at the equations. And before I even show it, let's kind of think. If energy is force times distance or length, and let's say we had the force the same, power is gonna be force times the derivative of this. So that's force times velocity, okay? Right there, power is force times velocity. Very good, right? And so let's again parse out, what does that mean? Let's think of a football player. Football player is very strong, right? And they can generate a lot of force, but what makes them powerful is that they can create a lot of force and they can move very fast. That's what makes something powerful, right? If you have a lot of force, but you're slow, maybe not that powerful. If you're very fast, but can't produce a lot of force, maybe not that powerful. But if you can do both, powerful, right? And so if you have a motor, again, that can produce a lot of torque and a lot of speed, you have something that's powerful. But if you only have one of the two, maybe the power isn't as high, right? Okay, okay. let's look at the units. Newton, meter, right? Meter per second, you have a Newton meter per second, which is a joule per second, watt, yay. Torque, omega, you have a Newton meter here on the left. Omega is a radian per second. Remember, radians are unitless, so you're left with Newton meter per second. Again, joule per second and watt, excellent. And I wanna highlight not RPM. In the labs, the, the machines and the software will, uh, will quote you an RPM. You have to convert it to radians per second before you do your power calculations, okay? All right, and just to hit home again, newton meter per second is the same as a joule per second, same as a watt, okay? If, if you're having any confusion, pause the video, Google this stuff, uh, gotta have this on lock, right? This is kind of the Ohm's law of engineering. You have to have these four fundamentals like this locked down, okay? Let's look at a radian again, right? Just to review, what is a radian, okay? So a radian and not degrees are used for energy and power. And let's just kind of come up, what is the definition of a radian? Okay, so we have some circle, we have some radius, 
And let's say we started here and we prescribe some angle, right? Now the distance here, which we call the arc length denoted by S, is the arc length associated with this angle. And the definition for this angle in units of radians is S divided by R or the arc length divided by the radians. Okay, notice if this is units of meters and this is units of meters, technically this is unitless, right? Technically unitless. Okay, so theta is S over R, just the definition of a radian that you just have to memorize, okay? And we've done this before in ET250, but let's do it again just to build some intuition. If we wanted one radian, that would mean that the S, the arc length prescribed, would be matching the radius, okay? So this length is the same as this length. If you do that, that's approximate. Let me just draw this. So here's your circle here, okay? If this is R and we wanted R, since this distance about here, eh, that's about R. This is about one radian, okay? And if you go around the circle, you can see that that's about one radian, it's about approximately 60 degrees. So one radian is approximately 60 degrees or exactly 57.2 degrees. And you can see I can fit one, two, three, four, five, six, and some change, and that changes 0.28 right, of R. And so one revolution, we already know is 360 degrees or 6.28 radians or uh, two pi R, two pi radians or one tau, I, I, should, I should put it, one tau radians. And you guys know this from my rant in ET250, right? Tau manifesto, one tau radians, very good. Okay, where, where pi, let me write this, is 3.14159 and tau is 6.28, da, 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 right? Okay, good, 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 good. Okay. And let's just see how this correlates, right? Radians versus degrees for energy and power calculation. I think you can already see that, right? We need something unitless for radians. But here's a, an example of a system, right? So I have a pulley. And I can either apply a torque at an angle or I can apply a force with some distance. And notice if I rotate this, this S that it's rotating around is gonna be the same as this linear travel that this mass moves up, right? And so you can see that the linear energy is the force applied times the distance, force times S, or the torque applied times this angle right? And they better be equivalent, right? We also know that torque is force times this radius. And we can see if I substitute in this force and radius, what do we get? Well, we get theta equals S over R. I can bring this R under and I get the same definition as a radian. So you can see that I have this rot rotary linear system and I get consistency if I use the radian as my definition. If I don't, if I use degrees, this whole thing is broken. I'm gonna to have to have conversion factors in here and I don't get this nice clean result, okay? So do not use degrees. I mean, I know we use degrees because we were raised with degrees, but do not use degrees in your calculations. Okay, uh, let's keep going. Okay, so now let's move on to flux density. So this is starting to become the meat of the course, right? Flux density. And this is actually, notice the hat, a vector. It's a vector and the units are Tesla or Weber per meter squared. Hmm, Weber, 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 Weber. That's flux, the physical quantity is flux and meter squared, that's an area. So interesting, a Tesla is a flux per area. Let's keep that in our head, okay? And then another useful fact is a Weber is a volt second. We'll see this later. This is kind of trivia, but I want you to kind of throw that in the back of your mind just so that you have it, okay? So some common numbers, right, for flux density B um, is that the Earth's magnetic field is very small. It's only 3.1 times 10 to the minus five Tesla, okay? I have another bit of trivia. I've, I've, I was actually playing with some magnetometers and uh, I, I, was, uh, I was using uh, the magnetometer, of course, to determine where north was. And I have this triple axis magnetometer, actually. Do I have it here? Yes, I do. Uh, I have it right here. So this is um, a little circuit I'm playing with. Here's a, tri 
there's a triple axis magnetometer on this chip, okay? So it measures the Earth's magnetic field in three axes. And what I can do is I can figure out, based on measuring all three axes, where is the Earth's magnetic field pointing? And when I measured everything and, you know, took my readings, I found that, let's say this is, you know, my ground, right? Or this is my table. And it was like the Earth's magnetic field was going into the ground. It's like, that's weird. Is that right? Like it was going down more than, let's say the, the north direction was over here. Only this little component was going towards the north direction. The majority of the Earth's magnetic field was going in. And I Googled it and I, and I found some videos explaining, yep, yep, this is actually true. And you can imagine if this is the Earth and we have the, the Earth's magnetic field, right, going around the globe, you can imagine we're sitting here in California, you can see that the inclination or declination, whatever you want to call it, is going more vertical than it is horizontal towards the North Pole. Very interesting. But anyways, it is a small amount. And, um, but I just thought you, you'd be interested in that bit of trivia. Okay, um, a fridge magnet, five millitesla. Again, these are both very small numbers, right? This is bigger than this, but small numbers. Now a neodymium magnet, which we will use uh, hopefully in our projects, if we do have projects. Um, these are on the order of one Tesla, half to one Tesla. And we know those are strong. Those will pinch your fingers, cause bleeding and blistering. Not, not good. Um, so you have to be careful. Okay. Um, uh, uh, according to Google 20, uh, or Wikipedia 2011, uh, the high magnetic field lab in Dresden was able to produce 95.8 Tesla. And they had issues with tearing co apart copper for their coils. Crazy. Um, and since then, in 2012, the National High Magnetic Field Lab in Florida was able to create 100.75 Tesla. Okay. And then recently, in 2018, the University of Tokyo was able to create something way more than this, 1,200 Tesla. Kind of nuts, right? So these are the scientific labs that uh, use this stuff for research. Quite amazing. All right. So now let's look at the difference between flux density and flux, right? And we already have a clue. We already have a clue. Flux density, Tesla. Weber's per meter squared, which is flux for area for flux, okay? So the physical quantity, we have flux, V, Weber, WB, and it's a scalar type where this is a vector type, okay? Flux density, B, Tesla, T, right? Vector type and AKA magnetic field. Okay, so if we say the magnetic field, we are referring to flux density. I mean, you got to be careful. We sometimes use all these words interchangeably. And so when someone's talking about this, you should like kind of get on the edge of your seat and listen carefully to see, do they really know what they're talking about? Or are they just kind of like know what they're talking about, right? Okay. All right. So you got Tesla. We know it's a Weber per meter squared. Good. Weber per area. Yep. Yep. Okay. Um, and just so that you know, you've heard of things like Gauss meters. Gauss is actually a unit of flux density, and there's 10,000 Gauss to one Tesla, or 10 to the four, okay? So they are, near, they are the same physical quantity, it's just a scaling factor of 10 to the four. Okay, no problem. But when you are comparing flux density and flux, you must have a surface area in mind, okay? Okay, so here is the image. Imagine flux density is like a river of flux, right? It's not really moving, but just imagine a river of flux. And I have a net, okay? And I want to get the most amount of water to flow through my net, right? The amount of water that flows through my net is the flux, right? And the orientation of that net is going to matter, right? If, if the flow is this way and the orientation of my net is like this, I'm not going to get very much flux through my area or my net. But if I orientate it like this, I'm going to get a lot of flux, okay? And so you need to think of a surface, right, to catch the flux, given that you have this field, this flux density field. Okay, I hope that makes sense. And look, so let's let's look at some examples, right? Um, here. So imagine I have this river of flux density. I have my area perpendicular to it, or uh, yes, the the area is perpendicular to it. I'm going to catch the most amount. Now, let's say we have 
on this net, it's a uniform area, right? It's, it's not like a wonky potato chip, it's like flat, right? And we have this normal vector, right? You guys remember what a normal vector, if you have a, if you have a uh, what do you call it, a plane, and then the vector that is perpendicular to the surface, that's what we call the normal vector, right? That's how we say it on the street, the normal vector, right? So if you take this normal vector, and you align it with the B vector, you will get the most amount of flux through this area. Does that make sense? I hope that makes sense, right? Okay, so in other words, if B and A are aligned, we will get the most amount of flux because if B and A are aligned, the surface is gonna be perpendicular to B, like that net. Okay, now if you have this situation where the area vector is perpendicular to the flux density in like this orientation of this or, or spinning around actually, if, if, if the flux was like this, sorry, the area was like this, Right, this is no good in terms of flux capture, right? Because no flux density uh, is going to flow through that area. Okay, so if B and A are perpendicular, right, if these two vectors are perpendicular, we'll not get any flux. So that is the intuition. Okay, let's try to think of a mathematical description that gives us so you can imagine there's an angle right if you have an a and b you could rotate this and you'd get an angle between a and b in this case you want if, if, if a and b the angle between a and b are zero you want a hundred percent or one right whereas here if the angle between a and b is 90 right you get something like zero hmm what trigonometric function would give us that probably cosine, right? Cosine of zero is one, cosine of plus or minus 90 is zero, okay? And that's exactly what they use or what we're gonna use, okay? So here's a useful equation. This is the definition of flux and it's gonna relate flux to flux density. So let's assume B is uniform, right? So what do I mean by uniform? I mean, each of these arrows are the same, uh, same value and all the arrows are pointing in the same direction, right? And A is flat, so it's not like a wonky potato chip thing, it's this flat area, right? Then we, we can have something like this where we can arbitrarily rotate this area and you would see that there's an angle here. And the amount of flux that this area captures is related by this equation. Okay, so let's look at this definition. Theta is the angle between A and B, good. This is your definition of flux. The amount of flux captured by this is B times A times cosine of theta. All right, let's be very careful about what's going on in this equation. Okay, cosine of theta, we're okay with that. If I have theta zero, I'm gonna get actually the most amount of flux because cosine of zero is one. If I have 90, which means this angle is pointed up, which means this arrow is rotated uh, in, in a non-ideal way, I'm gonna get a minimum amount of flux, okay? No problem, we just talked about that here. Now, what is B and A? Well, A is easy. That's just the total cross-sectional area of this, or the, we could say, the magnitude of this vector. And B is the magnitude of this, not the vector, but now the magnitude, okay? So these are the scalar values, okay? So notice no vector. So scalar, 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 scalar. As opposed to B with the hat, this is a vector, right? Because you need to know the direction. Okay, so that's why when we went, uh, I, I brought up physical quantities versus units and that added confusion, we have to remember there's a difference between scalar and vector as well. Okay, so here's an example. Let's say we had three Teslas. So this is the scalar value of B. We had, let's say, 0.7 meters squared for this area, and we had an angle of 22 degrees. What is phi? And so we can just use our new friend here, right? Three Teslas, 22 degrees, seven meters squared. That's easy, just plug everything in. Three times 0.7 times cosine of 22, and we get 1.97 Weber's, right? Remember, this is Weber's per meter squared. This is meter squared. The meter squared cancels, and we're left with just Weber's, yay. Okay, not too bad, okay. Now, the question is, we're not really going to do this, but what happens if you have a non-uniform shape here, okay? What happens if we have a non-uniform B here? How could we calculate this, right? And so what would that look like? That would look like something like this. 
right? This is gross, right? We have this ugly potato chip there. We have different values of B. Maybe this is two and a half, this is 1.8, 1.3. And then, you know, all of this area, well, the area vector here is pointed this way and this way, this way, right? It's, it's all sorts of weird, uh, uh, weird situation. Well, we can go back to how we used to think of our calculus. What if we divided it up into really little teeny bits to approximate this situation? Where if we divide up into little teeny bits, we could say, well, at the little teeny bit, we actually have a uniform B and a uniform A, and then we can use this equation, right? But then we can add everything up, right? So that's exactly what we would do. And here's the mathematical notation. It's this, right? We have an integral, which we know from calculus means addition. And we have B dot DA. And you look at that and you're like, well, how does this relate to that? That's kind of funky. Well, this is a dot product, which involves a cosine. If you recall from your calculus or math, um, a dot product is actually defined as this. If you have two vectors, you take the dot product. It's the magnitude of the two vectors times the cosine of the angle between the two vectors. Doesn't this equation look exactly like that equation? Yes, it does. So all this is saying, which maybe it looks confusing right off the bat, but all it's saying is saying, well, take the magnitude of B and A and multiply it by the cosine of, of the angle for all these little teeny bits and then add them all up, right? And so this DA is those little DAs right there, okay? Are we gonna use this in the class? Not really, but I just wanted to show you, you know, how would you, uh, how, how would you do a, a more complicated problem, right? Um, and, you know, take it or leave it, but this is very important. This one is just for your own personal satisfaction and curiosity, right? Okay. Let's, uh, and I think that's it. That is the today's lecture. So thank you for paying attention. If any of this was confusing, please rewind or pause. And then I look forward to seeing you in class and answering any questions. All right. Have a great day.